Well, good evening, everyone. I pray that today has been a great day for all of you. Uh, welcome, uh, Facebook family. Welcome, Greater Correct Church family. I pray that things are going well. Here in the city of San Antonio, today's high, I believe, was around 90, 98 degrees. Amen. That's called a little cool spell based on the triple digits that we have been experiencing over the last week to 10 days. So we uh, we're thankful to God for that. The virus is still out there. It's still running rampant. Uh, we had, I think the report today was over 1,600 new cases with 11 deaths. So let's stay in. If you don't have to go out, stay in, stay safe. And uh, if you have to go out, make sure that not when you get to wherever you're going to put on your mask, but from your house to your car. And then after you get where you're going, make sure you put it back on before you get out of your car. Amen. Great. So we got to stay safe. We got to stay work smart and we got to continue to pray for one another. Uh, let's continue to pray for uh, Sister uh, Heather Collins. As you know, uh, her mother, Sister Word, uh, passed about a week ago, and her viewing will be this Friday in Abilene, Texas, uh, at the North Funeral Home in Abilene, and the uh, homegoing celebration for uh, Sister Collins' mother will be Saturday morning at 10 a.m. So let's keep uh, Sister Collins and her family in our prayers. Amen. Also, let's continue to pray for our, our sick and shut-in. Uh, let's uh, make sure that we, uh, we are praying for them. The deacons are looking after our seniors to make sure they are okay. Uh, make sure that uh, Sister uh, uh, Doris James and Sister Alpha Brown that they are doing well as well as uh, Dr. Dolores Lott. We surprised uh, Dr. Lott this week, uh, this past Monday. Uh, Monday of last week was her birthday and we had a little uh, drive-by birthday party for her. So we pray that uh, it made her heart feel uh, glad uh, that even though we have not been in the sanctuary for over four months now, but that uh, she is not forgotten and that she is well loved. So thank all of you. Uh, it was good for me to be there uh, to see many of you who were part of that because I, we have not seen each other in a while. So it, it was good for all of you to to be there and to participate in that. And then we had that, got that extra joy and pleasure of seeing each other as you drove by and tooting your horn and and so forth. We made a little noise for Dr. Locke, but that's okay. We we enjoyed it. Amen. So now, tonight we're ready to go into uh, the last chapter of First Thessalonians. Uh, it's chapter 5. Some very powerful things here that Paul has written to the body of Christ, specifically to that church as well. And they are so relevant and germane for to times to which we are living. And we're going to get into our study in one moment. Let us pray. Eternal and all wise God, we thank you for your loving kindness and tender mercies. We thank you for being with us from our early rising this morning until this present time. As we are about to get into the study of your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be in the midst. Be with us now and guide us. And Lord God, of all of our getting, Lord, help us to get an understanding. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen. Okay, last week, last Wednesday, uh, from in chapter 4, from verse 13 down to verse 18, is where Paul talks to the church about, uh, I would not have you to be ignorant as it relates to uh, those who die in the Lord. And apparently in the in the church there, the Thessalonians were concerned that and but let also let me let me give you this little nugget here. This is one of the first epistles that Paul had written to the Gentiles. Okay? Even though it's all the way in the back of the Old Testament, this is considered one of the first 
that he had written. So therefore, there were there was this earnest expectation that Christ was soon to return. And therefore, there were those who were, were, were beginning to feel sad because of those who believed, who heard the gospel, believed, had that hope in them, but yet they died. And there was some concern that they would not be part of that, that rapture, if you will, uh, of those that, that would be with Christ and those who would be going to be with him. And, and so Paul here in verse 13 down to verse 18 in chapter number four, he didn't want them to be ignorant concerning those who sleep because he says that for those who die in the Lord, they shall come back with him. So if any of us or any believer who has not transitioned or died, as we would say, uh, when, when Christ uh, makes, makes his return, then therefore, but before we are caught up in a twinkling of an eye, before we are transformed, before we make that transition, those who have died with the hope in them shall be caught up to meet him. They shall come with him, not caught up to meet him. They shall come with him. And then those who remain, we who remain, as the word says, shall be caught up to meet them, what? In the air. So so he, he gave them that assurance that I, I don't I don't want you to feel sad because of those who have had that hope in them and they had they have no they are no longer living <clears throat> excuse me and so therefore he said I don't want you, I don't want you to be sad I don't want you to be ignorant of something ignorance means you don't have the information let me remove the ignorance or let me remove your you not having the information and give you the information that you need so that you will no longer be ignorant but now you can speak very intelligently about the matter so the intelligent thing about the matter is like we here who still remain and we have to go through the toils of this life we still got to live in this world in the world, but not of the world, but we were still subject to the things that are going on in the world. So as Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes would say, that when a person dies, that is a time for us to rejoice because they no longer have to deal with the, the toils of this life. And so therefore, they have finished their course. Those who have died with the hope, they have finished their course. They have finished this race. They have kept the faith. But don't think they're not going to get their reward. Paul says they will get their reward, not after you, but they're going to come back with him. So therefore, it's almost like they're going to see that glorious Christ coming back. And, and then we're going to be what caught up to meet them in the air. So Paul wanted to make sure that we understood that, that the church understood that, that we all are uh, going to see Christ, that we all are going to get to, as the songwriter would say, we're all going to get to heaven and we're going to have a day of rejoicing. We're going to sing hallelujah, praise the Lord, thank you, Jesus, of how we made it over. We remain faithful unto death. So, okay, so he wanted them to know that in the end of chapter 4, that don't be ignorant, hey, those who die in Christ, hey, they will be coming with him. And then we who remain shall be, what, caught up. All right, now, in chapter 5, it's interesting because he's going to say something that we've heard many times before. Look at the verse 1 and 2. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yourselves know perfectly, and that means you already know, that the day of the Lord, which means the day of the Lord has twofold. One, he shall come to what? Redeem us and redeem those who died in Christ. And number two, Therefore, the judgment shall also come with him. That the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. So therefore, he's saying to us, he's saying to the body of Christ, I, I have no need to write to you concerning when Christ is going to come and how, anymore as to how he's going to come, but he's going to come. No man knows the day nor the hour, but he shall come like a thief in the night. And if we knew when the thief was coming, uh, we'd be ready for him, won't we? We'll be at the door of our houses 
We probably, some of us have our six shooters, our, our, our shotguns and everything else waiting for that thief. And he used that example of a thief means that when you least expect it, that's when a thief comes. When you least expect it, when the world least expect it, Christ is coming. And so therefore, he's going to tell us as we get further into this chapter 5, some things that we have to do to get ready. He's not back. But he's coming. How long? We've heard that ever since we were a child. He's coming back. The Lord is coming back. We're living in the last days. We've been living in the last days from the time he ascended and until now. We're still living. But therefore, but we have some things that we must do to make sure that we are ready. Amen? So you see here, coming to the steep in life. For when they shall, when they, talking about what? The world. Those who are living in darkness, and he's going to talk about darkness in a moment here. That those who are living in darkness, those who think they got it all together, those who think they are in control, the, the prince of this world called Satan, when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape." Uh, uh, I think I shared with the current family uh, a few times about some young ladies back home who used to, I, I can see their faces, uh, Sister Robin and, and Sister Cheryl. They, they both were pregnant at the same time, and, and for some kind of reason, for whatever reason, they felt like they had the authority and the power to call things as though they were not as though they are. And the word does say that. But there are certain things that God has not given us the authority to claim or to declare. So both of these young ladies, pregnant at the same time, both of them decided my baby will be born on this date. And my baby will be born on that date. And, and of course, with me, I just sat there and listened to them, and I didn't say a word about it, and I didn't mess with them, and, and so forth, and let them, let them go on. And, and they were telling folks around in Bible study and, and the church family and so forth when their babies were coming. And so when both dates passed by, I, I kind of nicely said to them, you know, I really sat there and listened and I observed, and, and I didn't say anything, and I could have, but I didn't because I wanted them to learn. God wanted to teach them that there are certain things that are not in your control and certain things that you don't have the authority to call or to say what will and will not be. And so the birth of a child is not for us to say, even though I know doctor says that nine months is this, and if you don't have about a certain day, yeah, they may decide to go take it. But as far as God is concerned, he decides when life comes and when life stops. And so therefore, it gave this illustration concerning like a woman uh, who is with child. You don't know when it's coming. Don't know. So therefore, it will come. And when it comes, everyone will know. So as the thief comes, when sudden destruction comes, when, when the day of the Lord comes, everybody's going to know it's here and nobody will be able to escape. Amen. Because so, how many times have we heard? How many times have we gone through folks who will say that the that the end time, and they will give a year, they will give a date, and it will come and it will go. Why? Because no man knows the day or the hour that the Son of Man, the Son of God, our Savior, will return. Amen. Now let's look at verse four. But ye, brethren are not in darkness, there you go, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Now, ooh, that's, that's heavy there. That is saying, we who love the Lord, we who have accepted him as Savior, when the day of the Lord comes, it's not, a, it's not gonna catch us unprepared. It's not gonna catch us like a thief, like a thief would catch somebody who didn't know he was coming. We are in what? Great expectation for faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Our expectation is that when he comes, we are going what? Back with him. 
The day of the Lord is not for the believer, it's not for those who are walking in light, those who are part of the day, but as far as it's for those who are in the night or those who have not accepted him. So when the day of the Lord, when that day of judgment, when that day of tribulation comes, it's not for us. We should not be experiencing that because what? We're going to be caught up to meet him. Amen. Okay, so he's saying here, look at verse 4 again. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light, and the children of the day, we are not of the night, nor of darkness. So therefore, here again, who are we? Who are you? Who have you put your trust in? The word says, I know into whom I have put my trust. Our trust now is in the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, because of that trust that we have in him, we are children of the day. We are children of the light. Therefore, his light radiates within us. His spirit lives within us. We are his. We've been purchased with a price. We belong to the Lord. So when that, we are expecting that day to come. He's already shared with us in his word what that day will be like. And therefore, we don't feel that day. What we have to do is make sure that we be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding what? In the word of the Lord and in truth. Amen. So as we see here in verse 5, what? We are the children of light. And the children of the day, we are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, look at here what, what Christians must do in view of the day of the Lord. And what that means is what we must do knowing that that day of the Lord is coming. And there's there are a lot of folks who don't believe it's coming. It's just like when Noah was building the ark. They laughed, they scorned, crazy, go crazy Noah, and what is wrong with him? Rain, what is rain? And and therefore, there are those who make mockery of your salvation, make mockery of the, uh, when you leave this world, where are you going? But that's okay. You, got, you, got to, you just got to leave them alone. But we have to do something according to what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. Look at verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us what? watch and be sober. Let's not be spiritually asleep. Let's not be slowful. Let's not be, be all of a sudden so relaxed that you forgot all about what God says is going to take place. We must be sober. That means we must be what? Attentive, alert, be on the lookout for, watch out for your adversary. As Paul told the church at Corinth, be not ignorant of the devices of Satan. You have to be on your guard at all times. But even when things are somewhat smooth, be on, be on guard. Be on the lookout because you never know which way the adversary. But what the word says to us about the adversary, he goes to and fro. To and fro, up and down, seeking whom he may devour. Who is the weak link? Where is the faint hearted? Where is the one that's not being attentive? Where is the one that's not guarding his, his spirit? Where is the one that's not protecting his mind? Where is the one who has taken off certain parts of the arm of God whereby he can sneak in and deceive? We have to be what? Vigilant, sober, attentive eager to do those things that are pleasing to God. And that's what he's saying to us in verse 6. Verse 7, for they that sleep, sleep in the night. There you go again. Those who, hey, they, they're, they're, not, they're, they're not following. They, they don't have that spirit on the inside. They sleep in the night and they that be drunken or intoxicated, they're drunken not only in maybe the, the uh, what we used to call it, in the spirit uh, as we say, uh, the uh, uh, adult beverages, but they also could be very well intoxicated in the things of this world, intoxicated with the stuff of this world, intoxicated with the positions and the reputations and the wealth and the fame and the fortune of this world. You have to watch out that you don't be in those things and become a, a child of the dark. And that's what Paul was warning us about here. Then look at this, this other let us. Verse 8. But let us 
who are of the day, be what? Here's that word again. Be sober. Put it on the breastplate, here again, of what? Faith and love. Faith in God, love of God, and love one for another. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. That helmet, the hope of salvation. The helmet does what? Protect the head. The renewing of the mind. Our minds are supposed to be what? Being renewed in Christ. So therefore, in this mind, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So we have this helmet on that's going to protect us and hold and make us make sure we hold on to that hope. The hope of our salvation resides in Christ Jesus. So he's saying here that we're going to put on that breastplate of faith and love. And, and, and what does the breastplate do? Breastplate does what? Protect the heart. These vital organs right here. So you're going to have on that breastplate. That spiritual breastplate is going to protect that heart. And that helmet is going to protect that head. So when you got the head protected, you got the heart protected, hey, you, you're okay. You, you're straight. And so therefore, what he's saying to us here, that we're putting on that helmet, which is the hope of what? Salvation. And that hope means that one saved always saved. Yes, uh, it, it, something that cannot be uh, forfeited. You got to walk away from it. You have to walk away. God has paid the ultimate price in his son. Now we are sealed until the day of redemption. The day of redemption. When is the day of redemption for us who remain? When he comes back for his bride. Amen? Amen. Look at verse 9. For God who have appointed us to... For God... Here again. Let me make sure. Stop here. For God have not appointed us to wrath. That's why I, I share with you, the day of the Lord is not for us. The day of the Lord is a wrath that's going to come upon the children of disobedience, upon the unbeliever, upon those who decided that I don't want to have anything to do with Christ. Therefore, the, 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 for God have not appointed unto us wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So you, you, so you see there. The day of the Lord, twofold, to what? Redeem us and then bring judgment upon those who refuse to receive him. Who died for us that whether we wake or sleep, we should not live, we should live together with him. See here now, this wake or sleep going is going back to the end of verse, what? Uh, chapter Four, talking about be not ignorant, brother, concerning those who sleep, that whether we are what, alive and remain or we are, uh, uh, have died in the Lord, therefore, we're going to be with him because he is in us. So he, he wanted them to know that there. Okay, verse 11, wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. There, there are times when we need to be reminded because each and every day that we live, the only assurance that we have when we wake up in the morning is that Jesus is with us. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That when we wake up in the morning, he is there. His love is there. His presence is with us. He lives from within us. Know ye not that your body is the living temple of the Holy Spirit. So he is within, within us. But this day that when you wake up, it may, it may deal you a hand that is rough. It may deal you a hand that is unbelievable. It may deal you a hand that you thought that you would never see in your lifetime. It may bring something into your world that you never thought you would ever see. And therefore, that's why there are times when, as we fellowship one with another, as we come to church and, and fellowship and praise the Lord together, as we see one another, what is that doing? That is encouraging each other. That is, that is 
uh, uh, motivating us to hold on, keep going. And when you when you see a, a saint of God who who has been walking this way for fifty years, sixty years, seventy years, and they still have that joy, even though they may not know what you're going through, but just to see them happy and joyous in the Lord should be an encouragement to you that at their age, at 70 years of age, 80 and 90 or almost 100 like Sister Alpha Brown still has that smile and that joy in her should motivate us, encourage us that if the Lord can still give them joy at their age, he can take care of me as well. I can't control what's going on around me. I, I didn't deal that hand to me. So that's the world gave me that situation. But because of he who is in me, who is greater than those that are going on around me and outside of me, I have the confidence that Jesus, that God is going to take me through. So that's why sometimes I like to say that there's nothing that 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 this world sends your way that you and God or God and you, whichever way you want to put it, can't handle because he would not allow it to come if you could not handle it. Amen? Amen. So therefore, we ought to encourage one another. Encourage one another while we're walking in the light because he is the light and therefore we are children of the day and not of the darkness. We have to encourage one another even when sometimes this flesh feels awfully sad, feels down, feel out, we still have to encourage one another. Because sometimes it gets rough out here for all of us. Preachers are no exceptions. <clears throat> I got to fight, as the word says, fight for your soul salvation, for your own soul salvation. I got to fight for my salvation just like you got to fight. I got to dot the I's and cross the T's just like you. I get irritated, frustrated, uh, by things that goes on around me, just like everyone else does. Paul says, I try to do all things, be all things to all people and so forth. And he said, the last thing I want to do is try to help everybody else. And then I get there and God says, depart from me. So I, 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 got, I got to cross those T's and dot those I's just like you. So we all go through moments where sometimes we're in the valley. Sometimes we're discouraged. Sometimes we're a little despondent. Sometimes we don't feel our best. Sometimes we wake up a little moody. I used to wake up moody. Wake up a little moody. Don't feel like talking so forth. But as the day goes on, God lets me know that he's right there with me. And so sometimes we have to see that and understand that we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And understand what Paul means that when I would do good, Evil is forever present. But let me share something. Watch out for that one because sometimes folks want to use that as a means to justify them being ungodly, unrighteous, and unholy. Don't even go there. Don't even try it, okay? Because when you get ready to do something bad, the Holy Spirit will tell you, stop. That's wrong. You have no business doing it. Now, what we do is we decide to say, yes, Lord, and, and be obedient. Or we, we click the switch and, and turn it off and go do what we want to do. Amen, somebody. All right, I know I'm talking to somebody out there. So Paul says to them, you got to encourage one another. You have to encourage one another. Okay, now, now even as he said in the verse 11, even as also you do. Now, here was something he's talking about. That you, 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 we need to understand those who labor among you, deacons, trustees, ministers, pastors, teachers. You need to know them and know their labor and how they labor among the body. And he says here, and we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you, talking about those who have that spiritual authority over you, in the Lord, and admonish you. Oh, I like that, that admonish. That means that when you are doing something, okay, the word admonishment is kind of considered the lowest level of correction. You know how if, if you, 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 you raise your kids and, and you say, uh, sweetheart, don't do that because that's not right to do. And that, that's, a, that's a low level uh, correction. 
you, 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 you grab their attention by saying, sweetheart, or, or, or call them by the name and, and say, don't do that because that, that, that shouldn't be. You shouldn't do that because. And then they don't listen. You got to, you got to, you got to, you know, strengthen your voice a little bit and, and, and call their name a little bit stronger, a little stronger to get their attention. Why? Because they, they have authority over you you, that child, and therefore they're trying to get you, that child, to see that they shouldn't be doing what they're doing. Well, what Paul is saying here, that there are those uh, that God has placed in the body who has uh, the rule over you in the Lord, not, not busy about it in your business, in your personal life, but in the Lord, and therefore when they see that you're walking contrary to the word, then they are to admonish you and therefore, let, that means let you know that you shouldn't be doing what you're doing because the word said, because that's not godly, because that's not holy, because the word is contrary to what you're doing. And therefore, he's saying to them in this particular verse, where am I here? Okay, where did I stop? Oh, there you go. And I beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. And here you go, and to esteem them very, not just highly, very highly in love, esteem them in love, put them in their proper space of reverence and respect in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. I mean, no arguing, no fussing, no fighting. If you are admonished because your, your, your activities, your, your disposition, your attitude, your words, your reaction or your action was ungodly, then they who have the rule over you in the Lord, they have the responsibility to tell you. Why? Because they have the, they, they watch over your soul. They're watching over you. And so, so you, you, you got to also, there's a scripture uh, that Paul says, uh, obey them to have the rule over you in the Lord for they watch over your soul and must give a report. And you may say, well, who, who are they reporting to? Who do you think they're reporting to? When, when I see you acting ugly, <laughs> uh, for those that currently know what I mean by that, when I see you acting ugly and, and, and the word tells you that you shouldn't do and, and I'm doing this and that and so forth, then who do you think I'm going back talking to? I'm going talking to God about you. Talking to God about the body of Christ, about you're acting up, you're being contrary to the word, and you're not living according to the word. I'm telling God, yes, I am. I'm diming on you. I'm giving up the tape. Lord, Brother Joe got a hard head. Sister Smith got a high. They won't listen. I told them what the word says and so forth, and they won't listen. They just determined I am diming on you. Yes, I am. <laughs> and, and why am I doing that? Because I want God, if, you, if you're not going to listen to what the word says, and, and you're not going to listen to those who have the rule over you in the word, Lord, I have done what I am required to do. You have to deal with them, Lord. And the way God may deal with you may be something that you may not like. And then that's where you come back to your pastor or you come back to whoever has a rule over you. And then you want them to pray for you because the Lord doesn't allow, he may have, old folks used to say, he may have slammed you down on your bed of affliction and now you want every Tom, Dick, and Harry to pray for you. No, that's not going to work that way because you should have listened when all you were getting before was an admonishment, like, sweetheart, no, don't do that. That's not good for you because it's going to hurt you. you. You didn't like that because it wasn't strong enough. It wasn't forceful enough. It, it, it didn't have any teeth as far as you're concerned because you didn't feel any pain for it, from it. But now you know, God has caused something negative to come into your life. He has allowed something negative to, to influence your life. Now you're feeling the pain of it because you didn't listen when you should have listened. And so therefore, if you don't want that to happen to you, behave yourself. Something that Reverend Hyman says to us all the time, and a lot of us are picking this up and we're living with it. And God has given me a sermon on it, but, and I'm not, I'm not finished working on it yet. But he says that we should filter Everything that we're doing and thinking and, and thinking about doing or getting ready to say through the lens of the scripture. So if you filter what you're thinking about doing, what you're thinking about saying, 
what you ought to do. You should have knocked somebody down. You should have done this and that. Filter it through the lens of the scripture. In other words, what does the word say about it before you do it? And if you, if you follow that, uh, you, you won't get in trouble. Now, folks may not like your decision, but as far as getting in trouble with God, and that's what's more, more, most important, that you don't get in trouble with God. Folks are going to not like your decision, period. Some folks are going to love your decision, but some folks are not going to like your decision. It goes back to that old saying that you can't please everybody. So either you got to decide, am I going to please God or am I going to try to please man? Amen? Amen. So therefore, be at peace among yourselves. Now, look at verse 14. Verse 14 starts some, some commands that he gives to the church. Some commands that Paul gives to the church in, in preparation, knowing that the day of the Lord is coming, but in the meantime, and I like that word, that the word, in the meantime, that phrase, but in the meantime, you might be saying, well, I, I want to go on a vacation, but this pandemic is, is doing a job and it has really messed up my plans. And so therefore, but in the meantime, until I can, I'm going to be wise and I'm going to stay home and I'm going to stay in. Are you with me? You see how tie that together. In the, in the meantime, so Paul says, while we're waiting for the Lord to come back, in the meantime, there's some things that we as the church, we as the body of Christ, we as the children of light, the children of day, there's some things that we must do. Now look at look here, in verse, verse number 14. Now we exalt you or we encourage you, brethren, Warn them that are unruly. Now let's let's start right there. <clears throat> what he was referring to here about unruly, there are some those who have been called to do a work in the body of Christ. You know, every, all of us should know what our, our our purpose is in the body. All of us should know what our ministry is in the body. All of us should know where we should be working within the body of Christ. So what Paul is saying that there are some unruly ones. There are some ones who who supposed to be doing certain things, but they're not doing it. And so Paul is saying, warn them, okay, that are unruly. Warn them who are not doing and working in the body of Christ, not working in the church as they ought to. Some, I, I've observed it at Corinth, and I've observed it in other places, got folks who are set down knowing that they're supposed to be working in the body, but they got all kinds of reason and excuses why they're not doing what they know they're supposed to do. Now, let me, let me share with you when I say uh, reasons and excuses. When you have a reason and excuse for not doing what God has called you to do, then to me, what you're doing here is you have lost sight as to, to whom you're working for. Because when you put too much focus on, on, on man, and I don't care the man can be in the church building, uh, on man and what he or she says concerning what you are doing, whether it's right or wrong, whether you should be doing it or should not be doing it, then therefore you're losing sight as to to whom you're working for. And you have to understand that I'm working for the Lord. I'll never forget years ago, this has to be about 35 years ago. And I know I'm giving my age, but that's okay. What can I say? God shared with me that if you do what I have called you to do, I will take care of your family. And, and, and some of you have heard this before. And I would take care of your family. He didn't go into details. He didn't give me a, a diagram. He didn't give me a, 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 a timeline as to here's what I'm going to do and here's when I'm going to do it and how I'm going to do it. He says, if you do what I have called you to do, then I will take care of your family. And I'm here to tell you in, in July the 22nd, 2020, he has not failed me yet. In fact, he has, he has blown my mind it's awesome as to what he has done. Even when I was walking through a valley experience, many valley experiences, he still took care of the family. 
So, so what am I saying to you? He says that warn them, warn them that are unruly. You have no business being unruly. You have to, again, obey them who have what? Authority over you in Christ. Do that which God has called you to do. Exercise your gift in the body. Work your skills and your abilities, your talent in the body. Give of yourself to the body and God will take care of the rest. All right, then he goes on, comfort the feeble-minded, those who, who are weak at the moment, those who 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 are somewhat uh look they're not sure that they're, they're, they're a little feeble, they're a little wobbly at the time, but that's okay. All of us have been there at one time or another. He says to to us, comfort them, let them know everything will be okay. Be patient with them, comfort the feeble minded and support the weak. Be there for them. Be there for them. We're all in that at the same place spiritually. Well, not all there. That's why Paul, when he made the statement that 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 I, if meat offends my brother, I will not eat meat. Not only will I not eat meat, I will not do anything else to offend my brother. And what Paul was saying when he wrote that, it says that I know that meat doesn't save me, neither does meat condemn me. But if my brother, who is not where I am in knowledge and maturity and, and spirituality, don't see that right now, therefore, for the sake of my brother, I will not eat meat. And therefore, I may eat meat in my house, but I may not eat meat in front of him or her because they're not there yet. And I will not want to do anything that will be a stumbling block to them. So therefore, I will be patient with them. I will support them during that time when they don't fully understand until the time that they are there. And so here again, what he's saying to us concerning them, that, that we are to comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, and to be patient toward all men. Be patient. Now you notice he didn't say the body of Christ to all men. There's a there's a scripture that uh, I, I once in a while I throw it back at the at the ministers, and they know. And before I even say it, those who are listening right now, they know where I'm going to come from, and that is Hebrews chapter five, verses one and two. I, I throw that back at them because it says to the minister that we have to be patient and tolerant, even with the ignorant. And ignorant, I share with you that word ignorant. Ignorant doesn't mean that somebody is just dumb and stupid. No, it doesn't mean that. It says that those who are without knowledge, those who don't understand, they are without knowledge. So therefore, we got to be patient. So here again, he says to us, be patient toward all men. Okay, now, I want to show you something here. I'm going to read verses 15, 16, and 17 and show you how those three verses are together. But I'm going to read them first, and then I'm going to go back up, starting with verse 17, and show you how all three tie, tie in together. Look at verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves, among the church, and to all men. Rejoice evermore, Pray without ceasing, 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 okay? Now, what, 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 what Paul is saying to the Thessalonians here, that we shall, verse 16, 17, we should always be prayerful. We should always have that prayer life uh, with God. We should be praying for everything. We should be praying about everything. We should be carrying everything, every concern, everything that's going on around us that we will carry it all to the Lord in prayer. And because of that prayer life that you should have with the Lord, that you're praying about everything that's going on in your world, outside of your world, and for the church family, for your sister, your brother, your, your natural family, your biological family, your spiritual family, you're praying also. So that means that you have a relationship with the Lord. And because of the relationship you have with the Lord, look at verse 16. Therefore, you should be rejoicing all the time. Why? Because the joy of the Lord is your strength. That's an inward joy as it comes 
because of your relationship that you have with the Lord, and therefore because of the relationship you have with the Lord, you are rejoicing. Why? Because you, you talk to him all the time. You're, you're communicating with him all the time. It doesn't matter whether what time of the day it is. It is not a whole long drawn out prayer. You may just be riding your car and say, Lord, how are you doing today? You may be just 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 walking down the street and say, praise the Lord. Lord, I just thank you for all that you do. Lord, that's a pretty sky today. Lord, I thank you. That was a great meal that, that I, I had to see. Lord, I thank you for the shoes. I thank you for the job. I just thank you that, that I'm in the land of the living, even though my body may be aching. I may have to wear glasses. I may have, to have a hearing aid. But Lord, you've just been so good to me. You're praying. You're communicating with him all the time to the point where in you is a joy. It's a rejoicing. You are, you are able to rejoice regardless of what is going on around you. And because of your communication with the Lord, because of your rejoicing in the Lord. Now, let's go back up to verse 15. Therefore, the last thing that you got in your mind is to do evil to somebody else because they were bad to you. To, to do harm to somebody else because they try to do harm to you. That's the last thing. Why? Because of your relationship that you have with the Lord, the last thing that's going to be in you is to render evil for evil. But that's right. I get back at you. That's right. Your day is going to come. You wait. Don't, mean, don't let me catch you around the corner. Don't let me catch you broke down on the highway. I'll take care of you. That's the last thing that's, that's coming to mind. Why? Because your prayer life, Establish that relationship, that constant communication with the Lord. You're praying about everything. And because of that, you got that joy from within. And so the last thing you're thinking about doing in verse 15 is to do evil for evil. But look at the, also in verse 15. But ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves. Here again, do good among. Have that special love, as the word says, to those who are of the household of faith and to all men. So you see how those three verses tie in together what he's saying to, to the Thessalonians concerning their relationship with the Lord, concerning their prayer life, and concerning don't, don't render evil for evil. Do you know that when you render evil for evil and, and, and you get back at them, do you know you've already received your reward, your satisfaction? And that satisfaction is to you is a temporary satisfaction because now you see them suffer as you believe they made you suffer. So you've already got your little reward because you have rendered unto them what they rendered unto you. Or in other words, and put it like this, you don't, you don't got down on their level and you acted like they acted. Uh, as Michelle Obama would say, when they go low, we go high. Well, let me put it this way. When they act like the devil, you act like your Christ. You act like that. Let that light that's supposed to be in you come out and let it be seen that you live for the Lord, that you belong to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Let me get an amen. That I'm reading. I'm, I'm seeing your response, so I want to see an amen on that. If you don't give me an amen, let me see a blue heart. Let me see a red heart. Let me see a thumbs up or something so I know you're not, you haven't gone to sleep on me. Okay, so you, you see that there in verse 17. Now, let's look at verse 18. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. Do I give thanks to God because I may have a disease? Do I give thanks to God because I just lost my job? Do I give thanks to God because of uh, I've had another tragedy in the family? Do I give thanks to God because I just lost a loved one? Do I give thanks to God because... My whole world seems as though it is coming to pieces. What he is saying to us here, in all things give thanks, that, that regardless of what has taken place in our lives, he is saying that it is God who has given you strength. It is God's presence that is with you. 
It is God who has promised never to leave you nor forsake you. It is God who says that he has made us more than what conquerors through Christ Jesus. And so therefore what he is saying here is what you are given thanks for is that the Lord is with you. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will feel no evil for thou art with me. Paul says that whatever state I find myself, whatever condition that I happen to be in, whatever situation that has surrounded me or engulfed me or encamped around about me, whatever state, I have learned how to be content. I have learned how to deal with it. Why? Because God is with me. So I'm giving thanks, not because I can't see, not because my body is, is, is right with pain, not because I may have a disease, not because I have lost this and lost that, not because that I'm thanking God because he is with me and he's going to give me strength to make it through that situation. That's how I give thanks. Whatever state, I give thanks. Why do I give thanks? Because I must believe the word, not believe some of the word, believe all the word. For the Lord is my, what, shepherd, I shall not want. So therefore, if he's my shepherd and I'm his sheep, and, and therefore it says that I shall not want, then he's going to prepare that table, right? I'm going to, I'm going to be in that pasture. He's going to feed me. He's going to clothe me. He's going to protect me, even though there may be hell going all around me, but the, the Lord, the God that we serve will take care of us. And so therefore I will give thanks concerning that situation. Lord, I thank you. Even if you go back to um, Lamentations, when they had been, Israel had been taken into captivity and they had, had been taken from, from, from Jerusalem. And, and, and you know, when, when, you have, when your enemy has taken control of you and you are now a prisoner, you wonder what's going to happen to me. And, and they, they, they kind of like Jeremiah was, was, was uh, uh, kind of listened to all the things that had happened to them and what they were going through. And then, then the, the scripture said, but then I came, he said, I came to myself. And, 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 and what it is saying here is almost similar to the prodigal son. I, I, I was going through all of this and I was feeling sorry for what I was going through. I was feeling sorry for what had happened to God's people. And the same thing, the prodigal son, I was feeling sorry for myself. Here I am, came, I left my father's house and now I'm in a pig pen eating the slop that the pigs are eating. But I came to myself and the prodigal son went back home. The Israel being in captivity, the prophet came to himself and realized we are not consumed. And, and, and what he was, what it meant by that, yes, we are now captives. Now we belong to someone else. Now someone else is controlling what we shall do, but yet we are not consumed, which means we are not killed. We have not been killed. So every day that we wake up, we get new mercies. We get, we get new mercies. We get new every day. Why? Because great is thou faithfulness. For God is faithful. And we're going to see that at the end of this chapter. God is faithful. And therefore, we have to hold on to that which he has spoken. Okay, let's go on here. Now, look at, here, look at verse 19. Quench not the spirit. Know ye not, as the word says, that your body, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Know ye not that in you dwelleth and liveth the Holy Spirit. That means that you allow the Spirit of God to move in your life. You listen to what God is saying from the inward. You learn to listen for his voice so that you'll know without a doubt when God is speaking to you. Quench not the Spirit. Quench not the Spirit. Tie down the Spirit. Do not constrain the Spirit. Do not try to Prevent the spirit from doing what God has sent it to do in you, and that is to bring all things back. You remember I told you about how when, when we give it to do something wrong, we, we, we flick that switch? 
Well, when you flick that switch and ignore what the Spirit is saying, don't do that, you're quenching. You're, 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 you're going against what that Spirit is telling you, don't do. Amen, somebody. Okay, quench not the, uh, the Spirit. Despise not prophesying. I want you to look at the verse 20 and 21 because it's very important. I'm going to explain something to you here. Despise not prophesying. In other words, the, 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 the prophesying here is talking about despise not the preaching of the gospel. Despise not the preaching of the word of God. Despise not they who come and proclaim the word of the Lord. Just preaching the gospel, no matter how many times you have heard the gospel, we, the body of Christ, needs to hear it again so that it will bring certain things back to our remembrance. Why? Because we're in this world. We are bombarded with all kinds of stuff every day that you get up, you're bombarded with from the TV, from the radio, from the newspaper, the online conversation, the work, the neighborhood, the family, your friends. We are bombarded with stuff every day. We need to hear the word. We need to be reminded what God says in his word. So he says, despise not prophesying, despise not the proclaiming of the gospel. Okay, now here goes verse 21. It's very important. Prove all things. As you hear this gospel preached, as you hear the proclamation, prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. That prove all things means this. You don't just take what you hear as being true. You need to get in there and do your own research to make sure that the person is on target. Now, on, on, on last Sunday, I preached about learning how to accept what well, the decisions that God made. And I talked to the church, I talked to you about what? Two men anointed by God's prophets, called to be kings, both had sinned, and both repented. But one repentance was from the heart, and the other one was not. But what I said, I did a misstatement, and I wonder how many of you caught it because I did not catch it until somebody brought it to my attention. And so I made a misstatement. The, the message, the main thought of the message didn't change. That two men called by God to be king, anointed and prayed for by the men of God, both sinned, both repented, but one repented from the heart, repented from the heart. Where I misspoke, and I wonder how many of you caught it, I used the same prophet for both kings. And that was a misstep. And, and therefore, it was, it was Samuel, the prophet Samuel, that dealt with Saul. And it was the prophet Nathan that dealt with David. And, and, and it didn't change the essence of the message but those who had studied knew, caught it just then, that, uh oh we got something crossed here. Something didn't, 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 didn't click. And this is what verse 21 is saying to us here. Hold fast that which is good. But the first part of verse 21 says, prove all things. That meant that if, if, if it didn't click, if something is off base, wait a minute, I heard something that didn't, didn't sound right. It doesn't matter that it came from Sparrow or John or Susie or Mary. Then, then that means you got to get back in there and do your own research to make sure that what has caused a red flag to go up in you, that you research it to make sure that what you heard was either correct, either it's going to correct something that you that you didn't have right, or it's going to affirm that what you had was correct and somebody misspoke. Are you with me? So therefore, just because I may have the title of pastor, there are times when all of us can misspeak, but you have the responsibility. And that's what Paul was saying to the Thessalonians, that don't despise preaching. Don't, don't despise uh, the proclaiming of the gospel. And therefore, but you've got to prove it. You've got to do your own research. You've got to get in and do your own studying and hold on to that which is good. And so it's, it's important that you do that, that you don't be what they call a, a spoon-fed Christian, that all you're going to live on is what you hear somebody say that may not be, what, the Word of God. Going back to what, what Reverend Mother, uh, Reverend Hyman has taught us, taught us over and over again, filter everything that you hear, that you do, that you're thinking 
through what? The lens of the word. So, so, so therefore, and, and it's important that you do that. It's important that you well, prove all things and hold fast to that which is, is good. Verse 22, abstain from all appearance of evil. Now, this is so broad, but so true. It covers everything. Abstain from the very appearance of evil. It may be, let me use this example. It may be, and some of you may find it okay, it may be you and the madam and you and your spouse, you go out and you go to a restaurant and you're all there and you may want to have, a, let's say, a dinner wine with your dinner. Just the two of you. However, if you go out and you're with other folks around you that you're not sure about where they are in their their spiritual level and their growth in the Lord and their understanding of the word, you may abstain from that dinner wine because you do not want to what, offend them or appear to be what uh, doing something that is ungodly and unholy. And, and therefore, uh, and you're not being hypocritical, you're being concerned about the body of Christ not to offend. Remember, I share with you what Paul says. If meat offends my brother, I will not eat meat. Not only will I not eat meat, I will do nothing that will be offensive to my brother. So what it's saying about abstaining from the very appearance of evil, that means where you go, what you do, how you dress, how you talk, who you associate with, your inner circle, you have to be mindful that what you do does not appear to be ungodly, unholy, because why? You are an ambassador of Christ. You are children of what? Of the light. You are children of the day. You have to abstain from that appearance that folks do not get the wrong impression. Let's get towards the end of this here. And now, I, I love that. Now, if you go back from verse 14 down to verse 22, you see here things that the believer must do, uh, keeping in mind in light of what? The day of the Lord will come. So this is here from 14 to 22. In the meantime, while we're waiting for the day of the Lord to come, while we're waiting for him to bring us, come, for him to come back and for us to be caught up to meet him in the air, in the meantime, we have to do those things that he's talking about in verse 14 through 22. Then look at verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you holy. Talking about you doing those things that we just finished talking about. And I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that. Remember I told you about faithful? Faithful is he that call of you who also will do it. I am not a man that I should lie. What I have spoken, I am able to perform it, God says. Faithful is he that call of you. What? He called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are children of the light. We are children of the day who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. So Paul is saying to in the end, share this epistle, share this letter to all those who believe and that they will also be encouraged. Amen. Amen. Next week, we're going to 2 Thessalonians and start with chapter 1. And we, I pray that, they, that, that, that these five chapters in 1 Thessalonians have edified you to the point of understanding who we are in the Lord, that we should be rejoicing always in him and be thankful that God is in our lives. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you. We magnify your name for all that you have done. We thank you for this study. We thank you for all that's been said and done. We pray that those that those who are listening by way of Facebook, 
the current family, as well as our other family members who have come aboard to be part of our study. The Lord God, that they will get an understanding of all that they have heard. And if they do not have that understanding, Lord God, let them go back into your word and study and prove and be able to hold on to those things that are true, those things that are righteous, and those things that are good. We thank you. We pray, Lord God, as we continue to go through this this period of uh, pandemic in our country, that, Lord, we do pray for the leadership starting in D.C. all the way to our local government, that you'll give them the wisdom, the knowledge, and the understanding to make the right decisions on behalf of your people. Bless your people wherever they may be. Let them have peace and comfort within you. Bless Sister Collins as she prepared to celebrate the life of her mother. Uh, be with her, strengthen her and the entire family. We thank you and we magnify your name. In Christ's name we do pray. Amen and amen. I pray that you enjoyed the study tonight. I'll see you on Sunday morning at 1030 as we prepare for uh, going to morning worship. Also, uh, those who uh, you know uh, who your Sunday school teachers are, if you uh, are not signed up, please sign up to uh, be part of that Sunday school class, your Sunday school class. They have been missing you. I tune in to every class so I know who's there and who isn't there. Also, I'd like to say thank you to all of you who uh, continue to send your tithes and offering to the church. Your church goes on. Uh, you know CPS or the electric company, the water company, the electric company, all of those utilities as well as other expenses. Uh, it may be a pandemic. We may not be there, but they still send us bills every month. Amen. So as we have our own personal household expenses, the church still must go on. Amen. Let me see a red heart. Let me see a blue blue heart or blue thumbs up that you understand that we must continue to uh, be obedient unto the word of the Lord. Again, to all of you, we thank God for your presence here on this evening. Continue to pray one for another. Continue to love one another. For when you can love one another, then shall men know that you are his disciples. God bless you and have a good night and be safe out there.